for my call to worship, I'm going to use Psalm 16. I'm blocking that one. For... Thank you. You can reply with the dark type. Preserve me, O God, for in you have I taken refuge. I have said to the Lord, You are my Lord. All my good depends on you. All my delight is on my godly and on those who are in the Though the idols are legion that many run after, their drink offerings of blood I will not offer. Neither make mention of their names upon my lips. The Lord Himself is my portion and my life. The Lord I am alone is my portion. My share has fallen in a fair land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel, and in the night for washes he instructs my heart. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand, I shall not fall. Where therefore my heart is right, and my spirit rejoices, my flesh also shall rest secure. For you will not abandon my soul to death, nor suffer your faithful one to see the pit. You will show me the path of life. portion I, I left you. So our opening hymn is King of Glory, King of Peace, singing the faith number 56. Come to an opening time of prayer, of praise, of thanksgiving, of confession, and of lament. Giving thanks for all the things that we have been involved in and what we look forward to. And if you cast your mind just a week ago, we were in the midst of Remembrance Sunday. And with that continuing on to Monday, Armistice Day, we continue that theme this morning of peace and of remembrance. So let us pray. Loving Lord, the world belongs to you, the earth and all its people. 
how good it is, how wonderful to live together in unity. Love and faith come together. Justice and peace join hands. If Christ's disciples keep silent, these stones would shout aloud, Open our lips, O God, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. And Lord, as we have gathered this morning, in the beauty of the autumn sunshine, with the changing of the seasons all around us, we give thanks for that change. We give thanks for the opportunity for renewal. And we give thanks for the opportunity of remembering those who have gone before. We are made in God's image. We are befriended by Christ, empowered by the Spirit. And as we look around this church this morning, we can affirm in the faces of each other God's goodness at the heart of humanity, planted more deeply than all that is wrong. We come to celebrate the miracle and the wonder of life, the unfolding purposes of God, forever at work in ourselves and in the world. So loving Lord, having shared our time of praise and thanksgiving, and in our hearts we give you thanks for those moments where you have been close this week. Have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, servant of the poor, as we reflect on all the outreach activities here, have mercy on us when we do not fulfill our obligations to love as you have loved us. And we often walk away because that's the easiest path. And Lord, as we gather for worship today, we ask your Holy Spirit, the breath of life, to have mercy on us, to help us in our worship and in our prayers, to help us to confess to our brokenness, to the ways that we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. Lord, we know that you forgive us. We know that through your Son, Jesus Christ, we are renewed. And we know through the giving of the Spirit, we are enabled by you to grow in love. So before God, with the people of God, we confess to our brokenness, to the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. Amen. And we say the family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And to lead us into our time of Bible reading, and if Vanessa and Liz can come up at the end of this hymn, we sing number 186 in Singing the Faith, Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord.
The reading is taken from Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Thanks be to God. Our second reading today is taken from Hebrews chapter 10, initially verses 1 to 11 to 14, and then 19 to 25. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can, he can never take away the sins. But when this priest has offered all, for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ, Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Thanks be to God. Thank you for those two readings and to lead us now into the gospel. We we'll sing again.
Good morning. This morning's reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. Signs of the end of the age. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray together. Loving Lord, we have sung, we have prayed, we have listened. We now come to focus. Thank you for calling us here this morning. Thank you for calling us here by name. In a place where we find safety and friendship and family. And thank you for having that word that you have meant for us to hear. Open our hearts, still our minds, and help us listen. Amen. Well, this is the last Sunday of this sort of connectional year in terms of the lectionary. And we move to a different cycle and the Advent cycle, not for next Sunday because it's Christ the King, but after that, from Advent Sunday on the 1st. So the readings chosen for today are readings all about the ends of beginnings, the beginnings of the ends, and the new time coming in. And over the last few weeks through the lectionary cycle, you've been looking at the final teachings of Jesus and him bringing in the new commandment to love one another as he has loved us and greater love have no man, as we shared perhaps last week. And in the background of these readings today, we see a disintegrating world. And that's no different from what we are surrounded with today. But in the midst of that disintegration, and in the midst of things that look perhaps without any future or without any hope, There are signs of joy. And I have been encouraged to plant my spring bulbs this week to look for those in the summer, not the summer, the spring. Both the readings from Daniel and Mark seem to be talking about the future. But there's no indication about how far away that is. And we, as a post-resurrection sophisticated, perhaps, 21st century community who know the whole story from Jesus' ministry over three years, his journey to the cross, the absence on Holy Saturday, the joy of Easter Sunday, the arrival of the Spirit on Pentecost. We know all that. But yet there are still the times of the second coming to come that we look forward to, and signs of God's presence in our lives today. The disciples were struggling, 
as any of us are when we're faced with somebody going away. That could be going away to start a new job in a different part of the country, as we think of Reverend Tim's daughter and husband setting off to Manchester, the best city in the world, in a couple of weeks' time. My goddaughter now in Australia, but coming back for three weeks over Christmas. We know what it's like to say goodbye for travel, for new opportunities, for work. We also know a lot what it's like to say hello again when people come back. And I love being on train concourses at the airport when you see those reunions. But when somebody is talking about going away forever and not returning, that is really hard. We live as a Christian community knowing and reflecting that we believe in eternal life. And we know that we will meet again, and that is the absolute assurance of our Christian faith. But in these readings this morning, Jesus was saying, I am going away, my body will be crumbled like the temple, and they didn't still quite understand it. And he's trying to encourage them. Every historical era has read the descriptions of Daniel and Mark as describing our own circumstances. And perhaps we're tempted because we're human to second-guess God. And I, I know some of you quite well now, but if you have been in that, and it is a fortunate position, it's a privileged position, to journey with somebody as they leave this side of heaven. And you want perhaps just one more day, one more moment, one more time to share a piece of music. This is what Jesus is trying to tell us this morning. And Daniel speaks of the time of deliverance as accompanied by anguish. And that's a strong word. Anguish means more than frustrated, it means more than upset but it describes the lives of many in our time, living and dying with poverty, war, disease, torture and injustice. To long for a prince and a protector is natural. And we look for those people in our communities, as Daniel did, for the times when wisdom and righteousness will be visible. And with utter with utter simplicity, he identifies the missing ingredients that make it possible for us to inflict anguish, perhaps, on one another. We do not recognize wisdom and righteousness. They do not blaze across the skies. People argue with one another about what is right or wise and bury wisdom and righteousness deeper and deeper underground. So Daniel's Old Testament message of deliverance comes at a time when wisdom and righteousness are the lights in the sky by which we make our very movements wholly clear and unarguable. And for many years as a child moving to where I am now, I do follow the patterns of the moon and the beautiful full moon that we've had this week. Because Jesus is the light of the world and we've been given that light of creation. So when things seem dark, go and look at the sun or look at the moon and the stars. Because under those lights we will not need to condemn or praise one another. Because the light itself will make any judgment clear. Daniel is not looking to be justified to see his enemies suffer but he does long for an understanding of what is right and what is wrong. So on this threshold of a new liturgical year, when we move to year C, on this threshold of the year almost coming to an end, post-remembrance, and when the disciples long to know when, it's like that ultimate car journey. Are we nearly there yet? When is Jesus going to come? Well, he's already come. 
in terms of your lives, your ministry, your discipleship, your loving and your living. He's already here. But we are talking about the end times. And I'm sure those of you in education have had those spoof days where there's some kind of mischief said and a big rumor has started, perhaps on a Friday afternoon when it's raining, that the world is going to end. And everything goes into chaos. But of course, we're all back on Monday and it hasn't happened. But the disciples have their eyes fixed on the future. They are aware that they are part of something important, but a lot of the time it doesn't seem that they can identify what that means. So finally, finally, Jesus is sitting down with them and telling them the hard stories. This is what's going to have to happen. I am going to have to leave you. I am going to have to go to the cross. And I'm still not sure whether they all, all understood that either. So when is it going to happen? And how can we be sure that we are ready for action when the time comes? Perhaps as humans, we're very good at being active and trying to solve things by our own energies and our own hope and our own actions. Peter cutting off the ear of the centurion in Gethsemane. That was action that Jesus then healed. But God, through his Son and through the anointing of the Spirit, is calling us to a different kind of action. A gentler, kinder, slower, prayerful, spirit-filled action. Jesus simply describes to them the world that we and him have to live in. So as in Daniel's time of anguish, what is missing is any way of being really sure where the truth lies. Many different factions will be claiming to represent the work of Christ. And every side in every conflict will be sure that they're right and is on their side. Christian disciples will not always get it right. Some of us will be led astray and we will not always be able to resist being alarmed. And I encourage you to read Mark chapter 13 again later today. Because that is the strategy that Jesus gives us. When we face difficulties, when we face that last journey with somebody that we really love, or even when we haven't had that opportunity, with a sudden death. And that's part of how I, when I reflect on that final journey, say the things that you want to say and say them now. But say them in the sense of love and kindness and gentleness. We are a work in progress. The disciples were saying, Lord, show us the rest of the world and I'm right with you. All of them would come to very difficult end of life moments. The Hebrews reading recommends the exact same strategy as Mark. Concentrate on Jesus. Never take your eyes off the cross. In the work of Jesus, everything is already accomplished. We say not always. We may not always see and feel that we are caught in the middle of something hopeful. But the Hebrews reading encourages us. None of us are immune from reality. We don't wake up in the morning and surround ourselves with a soft duvet full of duck down or whatever, hoping for a lovely bump-free day. The disciples knew that the time ahead was going to be tough. But Jesus was saying, for your future, we must step into his life, into the suffering, the torn flesh, that is our hope and our reality. 
and we have that absolute assurance in Christ Jesus, an assurance of protection, an assurance of peace, an assurance of tranquility. It's not a fail-safe. It's an absolute assurance. It will not fail if we are not at the centre of it. The work we are given, perhaps, is almost insultingly small. And yet we are quite sometimes incapable of doing even that. And Hebrews encourages, encourages us that we have to learn to live together, even with those we have not chosen, in love and kindness, encouraging one another. We would much rather perhaps change those that we spend our time with. But God calls us into community, calls us into being. Many came after Jesus trying to, in, in, to act as imposters. Many came after him with false narrative. But we as Christian disciples, Work every day. Every day is a new beginning of living together, of being that face of Christ, of being that center of him, his life in ours. So in this hard time of year, when it's dark by five o'clock, we're a little sad because of remembrance. We remember those who have gone before. We are encouraged that this is not the end game. We're not nearly there yet. Every day is a work in progress. And every day gives us that opportunity to encourage, to build up, to answer the prayers of others, even when you don't know you're answering them. That cup of tea on the table could be just the right answer. So when the disciples in your mind are gathered around Jesus and they don't really understand the final journey, neither do any of us, but we understand the destination. So my message for you this morning, your future foundation is to fix your eyes on Christ, to follow his calling and the light in your hearts and to future-proof yourselves by building one another up, encouraging one another, until you see the day that that dawn. Amen. To lead us into our prayers of response and intercession, and I'll be asking you if you've got time to think during the hymn, we sing, the Lord my shepherd I'll not want, singing the faith 481. <laughs>
to our prayers of response and intercession this morning. I'll bring you a few names from yesterday. You've got this in other contexts, but there's Robert and Greg and Shirley. Are there people you'd like to pray for yourselves this morning? Okay, I heard the Gallagher family. Thank you. Those of you who know them know the context. Um, I also bring the family of Eileen Britton, whose service of love and thanksgiving I celebrated on Friday, and her daughter Sam, and Millie, her granddaughter, who will leave for Australia this coming Friday. And I've just noticed we'll take up the offertory after these prayers. So let's pray together. Loving Lord, as we sometimes feel that our pathway forward is unknown, we have that absolute assurance of your light and your love and your sense of direction. As we come now to pray our prayers of response and intercession, we think of those people who have shaped us, who have led us on the journey of faith, and who have been indelible, leaving footprints on our hearts. Tell them we love them and tell them we miss them. We pray this morning for the Gallagher family for Sam and Millie, for Robert, Shirley and Greg, and for Val's family, continuing to grieve Margaret. Lord, as we have these absences in our hearts, as we wait for hospital treatment, as we wait for the outcome of tests and the results, give us the courage to persevere with you and thank you for those angels that you send to support us that take us to the appointments who are there in the darkest hour and Lord at this time of remembrance we thank you for all those who work in our armed services for our civilian emergency services and we thank you for the safety of last week's commemoration and on Monday. We thank you for all those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our peace. We pray for our peacekeepers and our peacemakers. Be with our civic and national religious authorities who can work together in our communities for social justice and for peace. And Lord, in response, we look who are sat around us this morning, on our left and on our right, behind and in front of us. <coughs> We name them in our hearts and we say thank you for them. We thank you for their gentle discipleship, their gentle journey of faith, their gentle encouragement. Lord, may we also be the people who show the way, who have our eyes fixed on the cross and who will lead others to everlasting life. The Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers and hear the aches of our hearts. Amen. We now receive the offertory for the work of God in this church and circuit and community.
of Christ the master carpenter, who at the last through wood and nails purchased our whole salvation. Wield well your tools in the workshop of your world, so that we who come love hewn to the bench may here be fashioned to a truer beauty of your hand. We thank you for the offerings that we bring, and we ask it for your own namesake. Amen. And our closing hymn before a final reflection and the blessing and the grace is through the love of God our Saviour, 639 in singing the faith. God, lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth, lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust, lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. We ask it for our own namesake. Amen. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and with all those you love this day and always. Amen. And we bless each other as we share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.